move on to Ralph. Um, Ralph was here a couple years ago. He's considered um, an expert. Um, we really liked him. He's considered an expert in marijuana and the um, adolescent developing brain. Um, there's a couple of more things before Ralph the scene, and then Ralph. Um, Yes, just feel free to go and help yourself to things. And you know where the restroom is, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Christine Holly, and I'm the coalition director of the Drug Free Communities Coalition, located at the Arbor Youth Resource Center, um, which serves youth ages 15 to 24. Um, so tonight, we're partnering with the county, and we came bringing our parent support bags. Um, which is an effort to um, help us with our goal, which is reducing youth substance abuse of marijuana, um, alcohol, and prescription drugs. Um, what we know is the California Healthy Kids Survey um, told us that one in four of 11th graders um, have used marijuana in the last 30 days, and that is a 10% increase um, from two years ago. So kids are not only continuing to use, but there's been an increase in use. Um, our concern is how many parents um, actually know the harms of marijuana on the youth brain. Um, so we're really excited to have Ralph here again at the county, kind of going over um, the, bio the biology and the physiology of marijuana um, on the youth brain. Um, we also have um, books for parents in the back with a suggested donation of $10. Um, and it's a great way for parents to learn to talk more to their children about um, drugs. Um, also in our bags is something called a combo card. Um, it's 10 questions and it encourages parents to use those combo cards during dinner time um, or lounging time to kind of open the conversations with their youth and um, you know, kind of create that healthy dialogue. So again, thanks for coming and um, I'll be in the back of the meeting. Great. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hope you don't mind if I sit down a little bit. I'll stand up, sit down, whatever. Uh, coming out in the rain, coming here for the evening, I want to make sure that when you leave in a couple of hours that you say, this was not a waste of time. I'm glad I managed to get here. This was valuable. That's my whole goal here. Now, the way I have it set up here is it's a parent and community presentation, and we got teenagers here, okay, which I love, okay, but I teach differently to teenagers than I do to adults. So I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to blend the two together, and I'm going to do a lot of what I would do in a teenage presentation. Um, uh, but there's one slide that I'm going to ask you guys, uh, I don't show the slide to, to teenagers, um, but I, so, so I want to apologize for that slide before we start, but I think it's an important slide. So, just to introduce myself, my name is Ralph Cantor. Um, I'm old, I'm 74 now, I retired about nine years ago. Uh, I don't advertise, I don't do whatever, but I talk about weed. Mostly what I do is I go into continuation schools and talk with kids about weed. And then I started to do community meetings and, and so here I am. Uh, I'm not a doc, I'm not a scientist, I'm just a high school teacher that uses, and, and the, the, I'm going to go into the brain a lot, these are just models. They're not really the way it works. The brain and who we are as human beings is so complicated and so awesome, okay? But I'm going to take some pieces that, that we'll be begin to understand about this. So, um, my main message about weed, I am not anti-marijuana, not by a long shot. I think it's about time that marijuana got legalized. I'm sorry, alcohol is legal, cigarettes are legal, give me a break. But I want people to understand at the same time, particularly the adult community, but for also the teenage community, that it is different for a teenager to smoke weed than it is for an adult. That's really important to understand, okay? Because I, I'm, I'm up here teaching, and, and, and one of the teachers says to me, I, I, I know Mr. Cantor, you know, you're teaching me about the, telling the kids not to smoke weed, 
but I'm growing 10 plants in my backyard. How can I tell the kids not to smoke weed when I'm you know, growing plants? And I'm going, you know, if we were in Napa County and you have a winery, okay, and a person's running a winery, I can definitely see that person saying to their 16-year-old kid, I don't want you to drink now. I'll teach you the business. I'll, you know, whatever it is. But you are too young to drink now. I want you to wait. And that's where I'm at with weed. I want people to wait until they're 18. And, there's, and that's part of what I want you to walk away with from here is why. What, what, what just what is the story around all this stuff, okay? Um, so, introduce myself. I'm a teacher. Uh, I'm using models, understand the brain, and what I'm going to do is, is mostly teach you how this stuff works. And then I want to talk about communication. All right. So, takeaways. Why is the impact of marijuana different on a teen brain? I want to talk about dopamine. Understanding cannabis and how it works. I'm really kind of blown away in some ways. I don't know how it is up here, but in the Bay Area, people know about dabs and wax and blunts and bongs and vaporizers and you know all, all this other kind of stuff. But when I say to them, well, does marijuana kill brain cells? Yeah. They go, you don't know. No, I don't you know that. People don't know anything about it. I'm sitting with a group in Alameda County. They're rolling out. This is all what they call the stakeholders for the, 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 the marijuana people here, the growers, the sellers, the distributors, all these people. We're sitting in this room and I say, do, do you folks know whether marijuana is an upper, a downer, or an all-arounder? Very important to understand there's a big difference between an upper, a downer, and an all-arounder. And you want to know something? Nobody in the room knew. A lot of people say, well, it's a downer. It's not a downer. It's a hallucinogenic. It's an all-arounder. You can't trip on it by smoking, but you darn well can trip on it if you eat it and you take enough in it. So there's, and, and the reason why I think people don't know very much about weed at all is because you've either had a group that's, th th that was all pro-marijuana, so I'm going to tell you how good it is and have medicinal value, or they're against marijuana and how it rots your brain. It isn't, it isn't good or bad. Or, or, or We've got to get off of that and start to, to learn about it. And darn it, the thing has been legalized now. Let's get off of the pro and con, and let's do some teaching about weed because people know very little about marijuana. Ha! That said, red flags, there's a couple that are there. One of them is eating marijuana. That's a, that's a red flag because it gets very tricky. The other one is something called crossfading. How many people heard about crossfading? That's what I expected. The kids in the front to raise their hands. And almost everybody except people that work with kids don't know what it is. What crossfading is about is, is mixing weed and alcohol. Okay, so, so, so here in the Bay Area, we had a bunch of kids that got together at Bishop O'Dowd in Alameda High after a, 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 a game, basketball game, and they were going to crossfade. And the, the rapper said, listen, if you really want to get drunk, crossfade with alcohol and Xanax. That gets you really drunk. Good, thank you to really know that will kill you, okay? Weed and alcohol won't. Why? People need to understand the difference between an upper, a downer, and an all-arounder. So there's some red flags I want to talk about in there. And then finally, how do you have a discussion with, with your ch children around it? And we'll be out of here before 9. And I hope that we don't have a deluge out there by 9. I think it's coming in, though. Because it's such a nice, sweet, little crowd here, please feel free to ask a question anytime you want. Raise your hand, whatever you got going on up there. This, you, you came out here in the rain, you're here, I want you to get what you want. Please feel free to stop at any time. If anybody wants to reach me or you want a copy of this PowerPoint or whatever, my email address is rjcantor, rjcantor at AOL. Dot com. That's adultsonly.com. <laughs> okay. So, we ready to go? Okay. This is the one slide, guys. 
this is the one slide that I don't show to kids. I don't think it's necessary, but I think it's really important for adults to understand this. What this is is a conglomeration of MRIs that were given to teenagers and were given to adults where <clears throat> they had emotional uh, tasks to solve, uh, 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 cognitive tasks to solve, and they, they had them working on this stuff, and they took the MRIs and they put them together. And what we see is that the activity, very good, it's all right, the activity in an adolescent brain is not all the way up in the prefrontal cortex. We used to think that teenagers had basically the same brain as an adult, it's just that they didn't have the experience. Well, it turns out through this brain research, it turns out that they really are not all the way up in their prefrontal cortex. There's certain level stages of development. If you've seen a, a, a little kid when they're, I think it's somewhere between two and three, when you hide something, they now know that it's still under there, where, where before they didn't get into concrete reasoning, right? They don't get to that step yet. They don't really get up there until they're somewhere between 18 and 21. And I want to say something, before we ever had the brain stuff, it was the people that rented cars that figured this, this, this one out, that there's something that's not right there, okay? So what I want to say by this, and I'm, I have to apologize to you guys because I think it can sound demeaning, but a lot of people have drugs in their lives, alcohol, weed, or, or whatever, but to have a drug in your life takes a level of sophistication that I do not believe teenagers are up for yet. Teenagers don't have a glass of Cabernet. It's not, it's not the, the way, they are not up there. And what, my message to the parents is it's up to the parents to be the prefrontal cortex for their kids because the kids are not there. And you can say something to kids like, what were you thinking? They weren't, they're not there yet. I apologize to you guys for that. I know that you, you know, but th th there's a certain level of thinking where you're thinking way into the future and doing this planning that you're not all the way up there yet. That's the first difference be be between a teenager using weed and an uh, or drugs and an adult. The second is this. I love this picture. <clears throat> this is what I'm saying a teenage brain looks like somewhat like somewhere around 12 years old. I think what this is, can you see over that? Yeah. yeah. I, I think what this is is an aerial view in LA of a bunch of roads running in a bunch of different directions, okay? What I'm saying that this changes into by the time these guys walk out of high school at 18, now it doesn't solidify until they're 25, but by the time they walk out of high school at 18, it looks like this. A lot more simpler, right. What, what, there's two really important things that have happened during this time. Number one, there's less highways. It's called pruning. It's just like when, when, when a, 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 a gardener prunes a tree. They cut out big branches of the tree, so the tree has to really take its shape and, 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 and grow. Here, a lot of the roads that they didn't take during this 12 to 18 time get pruned away. So when you go to the bathroom at 15 years old or 16 years old and you urinate, you are urinating out thousands of brain cells. You are getting rid of them. It's exactly what's supposed to happen. By the time you're 18, your brain is lighter than it was when you were 13, believe it or not, even though you're, you're, you're bigger. You're pruning away the stuff that you're not interested in. The stuff that you are interested in, that you start to work, get to be major highways. They get to be hardwired in. So let me give you an example of that. <clears throat> the black one was the best one, and I lost it. Here it is. So let's say this is my brain. And for me, what interested me growing up was basketball. Okay, so in the beginning, in playing basketball, I'd be out in the front of my house practicing a jump shot. And to do a jump shot, you, you just, you first got to learn how to jump, okay? You're using your ankles, you're using your calves, you're using your quads, and you jump, okay? Once you get into jumping, you recognize that there's a certain spot in the jump where you don't go any higher, but you haven't started to come down yet. There's a split-second pause. During that pause, that's where you engage your forearm, your wrist, your fingertips, and that's where you take your shot to watch, 
Kevin Durant do that is an amazing thing to watch, okay? In my brain, I went through a whole bunch of connections that were my jump shot connections, okay? Now I go and I do it again, and I do it again, and I do it again, and I do it again. What begins to grow around the outside of these electrical connections is something called myelin. And what myelin is, is like insulation on a wire. The more you do it, the more it insulates that wire, the better that puppy fires off. So that after a while, that just gets hardwired in. So the two things that are happening during this time is things that you're not working get pruned away, things that you are working get hardwired in. It's a very crucial time in brain development. Okay. So, let's look at this brain for a minute here. There's a lot of ways to look at the brain, and one of them which you may not be that interested in, but some of the people that are working, and, and I'm going to talk, tomorrow I'm going to be working with people that, that, that are working with youth and in education, this piece I think is really important for people to understand. Where, where I worked at the Alameda County Office of Education, they were very concerned with this thing called the prefrontal cortex, okay? This is the place where people learn how to read and write and, and, and communicate and all that <laughs> other kind of stuff. And the whole idea in education, at least from the county office's point of view, is how do you close the achievement gap? How do you get those kids that are more marginalized to really raise their reading and writing and math scores? So they try to figure out a uh, uh, different strategy or a different curriculum or a different way of approaching it here. How are we going to get this information into this kid's head? But I, I want to say that in brain development, the first part is this reptilian brain way down here. And this is the part of the brain that's concerned with safety. Anybody going to hurt me? Do I have enough food to eat? Do I have enough air to breathe? This is the part that's, that, that, that's into survival. Okay. Next part is what's called the mammalian brain, which is basically when we stopped eating our young and started to raise our young. Okay. So this is where connection and love and the limbic brain is. And then is this amazing prefrontal cortex. But for a lot of kids who have grown up in, in more chaotic homes or, or homes that weren't that safe, for them, this is a very important thing at, 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 at a school because they, they, they got their guards up all the time. So it becomes really necessary for a person that, who might have been traumatized or whatever to really know this is a safe space to be in. Then, the next part is, do I belong here? <coughs> do I fit in with anybody? Does anybody care whether I'm here or not? So heart becomes really important. Then comes the prefrontal cortex. Now, for a lot of kids who are, uh, you, you know, are, are, are well taken care of, they're well loved up, they walk into school, they're ready here. But for a lot of the kids who are more marginalized, it's really necessary for it to be safe. It's really necessary for it to have heart and belong. Then you can get to that prefrontal cortex. People looked at me like I was a touchy-feely guy. I'm sorry, this is not touchy-feely. This is the way we work as human beings. Is we need, this is a hierarchy of needs where we get here so long as we feel like we belong and we feel safe. That's the first thing about it. Second thing. <clears throat> The reason I, I don't teach middle school. The reason I don't teach middle school is uh, I went into a middle school class, did a class that night. I'm making supper for my, for my son, and the phone rings, and a, and a woman calls up and says, are you Mr. Cantor? I said, yeah. She says, what the hell did you tell my kid today in class? Did you tell my kid he smokes marijuana, it might make him feel good? I don't want my kid to know that. You told my kid he smokes marijuana, he bites into an apple, it might taste better? What the hell are you teaching my kid? I stopped teaching middle school, okay? I want to do drug education, all right? So, <laughs> so yes, I want to do drug education. So here, 
we, only us and dolphins, have got this thing in the front, <laughs> this prefrontal cortex. And I'm not sure that, that dolphins use it, okay? But we sure do, all right? And th the reason why I'm going into high school and talking with kids there is because what's going on in high school, what's going on with these two pictures, is that you are leaving childhood and starting to come into, I don't know what an adult is, but, but you're starting to come into what I want to say is individuation. You're starting to figure out who the hell you are. When you were 10 years old, you played with friends and you did whatever. But at 15 years old, who do you want to play with? And when you get together, what do you want to do? Now you start to figure out, well, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. This is what I'm interested in. That's called individuation, OK? And during this time, as you start to individuate and figure out who you are, you got your parents telling you stuff. You got the school telling you stuff. You got your friends telling you stuff. You got your media telling you stuff. But meanwhile, you got a whole rest of your brain here. That's also very much who you are. Only it don't talk English. It doesn't talk language. It doesn't make sense. It isn't rational. It isn't even conscious. But this has a lot to tell us also. And this is a lot of where drugs work. So I want to take a place deep in here called the nucleus accumbens. And I want to take this place and first of all take a slice of it, lay it on a slide, and look at it under a microscope. And when we look at it under a microscope, it looks like this. Now where I'm going with this stuff is that I want, and I'm talking to teenagers now, I want you to tune into this. This is, a, this is telling you who you are. All these people are telling you who you should be. But this in here, this, this is built in for something real important. So here, here I just drew not a kite. This is a brain cell. This is the cell membrane. Yo, go for it. Um, if I had to take a guess, the things coming off the corners would be the actin terminals and dendrites. You got it, man. You got it. What he said was it's going on. What was the first word you used? Axon terminals. The axon terminals and then the dendrites. So you got us. This is a cell membrane. This is the nucleus, and you got these axons going out that end up in these dendrites. Okay. Now, and here's another one. Now, the whole idea in the brain is how do brain cells talk to one another? How do we think? How does the brain work? And in order to understand that, we go to the end of, end of the dendrite on one brain cell and the end of the dendrite on the other. They come close, but they don't touch. Like, say, right here or, say, right here. And I want to take that spot and blow it up more. Go for it. Like a little gap and they use a little, like a little jump over. Like a little yes. gap where they jump over. Don't you love it? You guys know what? Yeah, we got to talk afterwards how you've got this stuff. So here's this little gap. Here's the end of one brain cell. Here's the beginning of the next. And basically, the way the brain works is you get input into the brain all the time. So right now, for a lot of people, you're, you're, you're listening to me talk about the brain. Okay, you may be already two steps ahead, figuring out, let's see, I think I know where this guy's going to go next on this. You know, uh, somebody else might be thinking, oh, geez, I hope my kids are getting fed. I don't know what's going on in anybody's <laughs> brain, but there's something happening in everybody's brain. When it comes into a brain cell, here's the deal. The brain does basically two things. Number one, it's a chemical factory. It's cooking up chemicals all day long. They're called neurotransmitters. Second thing, that, so it, it gets an input into the brain, and it says, OK, with this input into the brain, I think I'm going to cook up this particular neurotransmitter. And it cooks it up, makes it up, and it loads it onto this brain cell. Then the second thing that happens is an electric spark. And the electric spark is called a? You know it. I know it's right on the tip of your thing there. Electric spark is called a? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Just space between it. A synapse. This is the synaptic space, but the synapse is the electric spark. When the electric spark, when that synapse happens, what it does is it fires across this space whatever neurotransmitter it chose to make. 
And when that neurotransmitter hits the receptor site on the next brain cell, we experience something. We either think something or we feel something. And then it goes on to the next brain cell and the next brain cell. And that's a rough idea of how the brain works. Now, way down in this nucleus accumbens here, it happens to make one second, one second, just let me fire this one out here, it happens to make a particular neurotransmitter called dopamine. And when dopamine hits the receptor site, some really important things happen. Go for it. Isn't there like a thing like, okay, so you do something over and over and over again, like feeling or like drinking something. I think so. Wouldn't you feel that if you do that, it'll be more and more common to where you will feel it <clears throat> all the time? And like you would like know that you're gonna, that what's gonna happen, say if you drink it, Sorry, I'm, I'm no, you're, you're, you're right there on one part. The other part that I thought you were going to say on that is, and you feel it less and less. Yeah, the guy that more. I heard it from is like, um, he's really smart. It's like I couldn't keep up with half the stuff he said. Well, you know, a, a lot of times when we learn stuff, uh, like in math, because I used to be a math teacher, it's like you learn it, and you learn it again. You know what I mean? It's, it's, so this is going to take you on a really great start. This is going to take you to that next spot. Okay, so it fires off deep down inside in here, it fires off this drug dopamine, okay? All right. When you first get born, the first moments you slip out of your biological mother's womb, they cut the umbilical cord, they tie it up, they sponge off the mucus in the blood, and then some, hopefully somebody comes along, picks that baby up, brings that baby to their chest, and gives that baby some milk. When that milk touches that baby's lips, for whatever reason, through God or nature that's built into that baby's brain deep down inside here, it causes that milk comes into the baby's brain, and it causes it to fire off dopamine. And when the dopamine fires off inside that baby's brain, the baby goes, milk. Yeah, milk. That feeling, is, it, it, it's, it's, it's like the mind-body connection. That feeling of yeah in the brain is dopamine hitting a receptor site. So they want it more and more, but then they feel it less and less. That's where we're going with this stuff, but hang on, let's not, hang on a minute. We used to think that dopamine was pleasure. Somebody touches your skin nice, it fires off some dopamine, and you go, yeah. Uh, you, you have some chocolate ice cream, yeah. yeah. And so we thought it was pleasure. It turns out dopamine is way bigger than that. See, if the baby doesn't get milk, the baby dies, all right? So what this thing is telling this baby inside this baby's brain is, baby, milk, important. That's important. Really, what dopamine is, is the what's important filter. It's built in to tell you, baby, you pay attention to milk, man, because this is important for you to be alive, okay? So what dopamine really is, is the what's important filter. And in the beginning, for everybody, uh, 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 you get held, that fires off dopamine, milk, it's the same. But when you begin to individuate, when you begin to start to figure out, well, who am I here? What fires off dopamine for me here? Now, all of a sudden, it may be different. If I rolled a 56 Chevy into this room and I lifted up the hood, maybe a couple of people would go, wow, man, check that out, okay? A lot of people couldn't care less what's underneath the hood of a 56 Chevy. Somebody else, it takes something else. And so part of what you want to do in the beginning is pay attention to this guy here. What is this? Are you, are you more of a people person? Are you more of a science person? Are you more of an art person? Are you more of a, 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 a literature person? Who are, what, where are your interests? Where is your juice? What is important to you? This is what can tell you that more important than anything else. Okay, so here's where drugs come into this stuff. Instead of this, somebody comes along and says, here, smoke a little of this. 
tetrahydrocannabinol, the active ingredient in marijuana. Or, let's throw one more out here, alcohol, okay? There can be many, but we're going to just stop at those two, and I may just get rid of the alcohol thing here, too. Now, here's where people's brains are different. You look around, everybody's got a different face. Everybody's got different everything. You inherited your face, your brain, your, your organs from your biological mother and father. And they inherited it from their biological mother and father. And they had, so when you finally get here, you're all sitting here with different brains. So somebody smokes weed or alcohol. Well, let's just do it with the weed, because it's in the cross over here. Somebody smokes weed. Oh, no, I'm sorry. There's a lot of people that get born with a brain that look at this weed and alcohol thing and say, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do that to your brain? I don't get it. And they don't use it all, OK? Somebody else gets born with a brain where they go, oh, that's kind of interesting. Maybe I'll smoke a little weed. And they smoke a little weed, and they get paranoid. OK? They don't smoke anymore. Some other people, yeah, go for it. And then there's some who's already who are born addicted to uh, multiple substances because oh, of their oh, parents' yeah. choices. Oh, that's a whole other ball game here. That's where they're inheriting a brain that, that not just, it, it isn't so much the brain, but they're, they're, it, it, every time the mother used the drugs, it went to the baby too, right? It's all, it's all it's connected. So naturally, the by that time, the baby is addicted. Yeah, yeah. All right. So people are getting born by different mothers and fathers, okay? Some people get a brain where they smoke weed, and it does this. This person says, hey, that's pretty good. I like that. Maybe I'll do it again sometime. Some people get born with a brain where it does this. What we used to say in the Bronx, but a bing. It fires off a whole bunch of dopamine. For this person, this person says, this, boy, wow, I, I, this is great, okay? Now, I want you to picture a 13, 14, 15-year-old kid smoke some weed and it fires off a whole bunch of dopamine. I don't care what this kid's parents say. I don't care what this kid's friends say. I don't care what anybody says. What this kid's brain is telling this kid is, ooh, this good, this important. This is as important as mother's milk, okay? So I wanna say some things about this. This feeling of firing off a whole bunch of dopamine, in my opinion, I think is a good thing. I want everybody to be able to have some place where they can fire off stepping onto a lacrosse court or, or reading a book or, or, or whatever it is. You want to find out what, where is your juice? What makes you feel alive? What fires? This is a good thing. This thing, this weed thing, I'm not saying that weed is good or bad. We've got to get off of the good or bad. But one thing that's really important that you need to understand is that this is a trick. This is not the real thing. This is a trick that has the ability to trick some brains to be able to fire off a whole bunch of dopamine so the brain says, yes, thank you very much. But it's not the real thing. And I want to say something here for people that are not all the way up in the prefrontal cortex. They can look at this and go, this is it. This is, what, this is good. This is, you, you, you follow what I'm saying here? Rather than be able to have that separate, this is a trick. And I'll tell you, I think it's a better trick than alcohol or cocaine or all that other kind of stuff. It's just that to trick your brain between 12 and 18, this, is, this thing that's in here is here to tell you who you are. It's telling you what you like and what, what you... It's not to be messed with and played with at this point. You come to a party at 15, 16 years old, I know you, you, you feel uncomfortable. Well, you need to figure out, how do I party here? Somebody comes along and says, you don't have to worry about that. Smoke a little of this. Drink a little of this. You may be sitting in the same chair, but you're partying. Okay? You get together with friends at 15, 16 years old. What are you going to do? That's a really important question that you didn't have to figure out when you were 10. What are you going to do? And in this area, it's so easy for somebody to say, I know what, let's just roll ourselves a fat one. 
That way we can all get loaded and we don't need to figure out what to do. It's a done deal. You follow what I'm saying? And so you start to trick this puppy, all right? And it works. The thing about this weed thing that they've done up here, it, this drug really works. You get bored. God's way of telling you to get a life, okay? <laughs> Smoke a little weed, you're not bored anymore. You get, get together, you don't have to figure out, you, what, you get stressed. Smoke some weed, you're not stressed anymore. You, you can use it for all these things, but the problem is what you're doing is you're short-circuiting the work that you need to do between 12 and 18 to figure out who you are. And who you are is what you like and what you're interested in. Marijuana is not going to kill you, you're not going to die of an overdose, but you get to be 18 years old and all of a sudden you got this stuff hardwired in. In the beginning, go for it. Um, I actually think overdosing on THC is possible. No, not the THC, the CBD from the edibles is possible for our marijuana. You can't overdose on smoking it, but eating too much of it can kill you. There's, there's no Not, I don't think so. And, and the there's, CBD stuff, I, 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 I'll tell you, I honestly think the, the CBD stuff that doesn't get you high, uh, I think that that has enormous medicinal value. Uh, let, 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 me, let me finish this. I'll, I'll talk about eating it and what an overdose is in a second. But what I want to say first is that at this point between 12 and 18, it's necessary for you to figure out how do I have a good time? How do I take care of my stress? How do I hang out with friends? Where is my interest? Where is my juice? Well, that's your job now to, to short circuit it here. And I want to say in the beginning, you have to figure out where you're going to buy weed. And then after you figure out where you're going to buy weed, then you've got to get money for it. And then when you get money for it and you buy it, and then you look at it and you go, well, how do I do it? Do, do you put it in a pipe or do you grind it up or you do whatever? Then you say, you've got to get all the accoutrements for it. Then you get all the accoutrements. Then you get everything for it. Then you've got to figure out where you're going to do it, okay? And then you do it. It fires off a whole bunch of dopamine. The brain says, thank you very much. When are we going to do it again? Next time it's a lot easier. Next time is a lot easier. Next time is a lot easier. So that you end up getting that weed thing hardwired in. It gets to be one of those major highways here. And this eventually becomes a dead end street. And here's where we're getting into what you were talking about. Number one, even if you were Brad Pitt or Madonna, you're not going to fire off this much dopamine. Your brain is not, you, it doesn't do that. Only a drug does that. So the brain says, i got to make more dopamine receptor sites so I can handle all the dopamine. And so what you begin to create is what I call a party brain that says, OK, we got these receptor sites now. Where's the dopamine? Because we are ready. The second thing that happens, and this is what you were talking about, is as you pound these receptor sites with dopamine, they start to get duller you don't feel it as much anymore. So now you're going to need more of this to make this work. So you're starting to develop a brain where you need more and you feel it less. That is the struggling of, of an, an addict, is wanting it and not being able to feel it as much. <clears throat> so maybe at some point the thinking part of your brain says to this nucleus accumbens, listen, we got to stop. This guy who doesn't talk English goes, no, I don't want to. No, we got to stop now. I don't want to. We got to I want it. And you get a war inside the brain. And when this guy wins, that's what addiction is. When you go against what your brain is telling you you shouldn't be doing. It's like me after 35 years of smoking cigarettes, taking a cigarette out of my pocket, lighting it up, taking an inhale and going, man, I gotta quit smoking cigarettes. Right, what that is is this part of the brain telling this part of the brain, I don't care what the heck you want so long as I got my cigarette. So maybe now you gotta go into rehab. What do you rehab to if you never did form these things in the first place? You never did figure out how do I take care of stress, how do I have fun, where are my interests, all of that stuff. You haven't figured it out. 
So you don't, you don't have anything to rehab to. You've got to figure this stuff out all over again. And you've got it hardwired in so that you've got to break the biology as well. It's a very, if you can only wait until you're 18, let this puppy form. Let these roads lead to places that really fire off dopamine for you. Once you get past 18, you've got a lot going on here. It's a different ball game. But right now, and it's not going to kill you, but what it does is it takes you off of your path. It's hard, you need, and it's hard to figure out who am I and how I'm going to do this. But the weed is, is a, is, it, it, it's short-circuiting a very essential process that you're going through. Does that make sense? Let's talk about weed. There's a few plants on the planet, not very many, but a few plants on the planet that happen to have chemicals in them that match chemicals in the human brain. Example, in China and Afghanistan, they got a poppy plant, but it's not like the California poppy plant. The poppy plant there gets a big thick stem, and when it gets ripe, it gets a bulb. If you squeeze that bulb, a liquid comes out that matches something in the human brain. The liquid is opium. The human brain has an opioid site. It says, I know you opium, I do it myself, come on in. And so like a key into a lock, opium comes into the human brain, goes into the opioid site, changes the way it works, and somebody gets high on opium. There's another plant on the planet, the cannabis plant, that marijuana plant. And inside the cannabis plant, there are really two sets of drugs. One is the CBDs that we talk about, that, that, you know, the medicinal thing. But the other is a drug called you want to say the word for me? We're going to have to get familiar with this word. Tetrahydrocannabinol, better known as THC. The human brain says, I know you tetrahydrocannabinol. I do it myself. Come on in. So like a key into a lock, you bring THC into a human brain, and you wait about five minutes. And then you take an MRI or a PET scan, and you'll see it, to look to see if there's any activity that's changed inside the brain. And what you see is that there's five places in the brain, three big ones and two little ones that just light up. Those five areas in the brain are cannabinoid sites. They say, we know you THC, we do it ourselves, come on in. <clears throat> the THC comes into these five sites, changes the way they work, doesn't kill brain cells, <clears throat> changes the way they work, and somebody feels high on weed. This guy here fires off the dopamine, that's the thing that goes, yeah. This guy here, the hypothalamus, when it, when it gets hit by THC, you get hungry. That's what gives you the munchies, okay? This place back here, the cerebellum, when it gets hit by THC, it slows you down. This thing handles coordination, not just physical, but mental. And all weed does to it is slow it down. So if you're a little bit ADD and you smoke some weed, you're not so ADD for a while. All of a sudden, you can chill. Okay? It also slows you down in coordination. So if you were driving a car and something weird happens and you've got to move your foot from the gas to the brake real quick where your, your, your reaction time is slower, okay? It just slows that whole thing down. This guy here, the hippocampus, this plays with memory. Now, I'm going to talk, it's very interesting, because if you knock out memory, everything seems fresh and new. And this guy here, the amygdala, well, that's a bit mysterious, and we don't know a lot about it, but we'll learn about it. Anyway, it's this drug, THC, that stimulates these five cannabinoid sites, and that's what makes somebody high. Now, I don't have to teach this stuff up here as much as I do other places, but I want to go through this history of THC stuff a, a, a little bit here, although I know a lot of people are more familiar with it up here than you are in some other places. I went to high school in New York, in the Bronx, Tough high school in the Bronx, 1958 to 1962. There was no weed. As a matter of fact, hardly anybody even heard about weed. A trumpet player, Miles Davis, he got busted for weed. Other than that, nobody really heard about weed. 1962, I graduated high school. I went off to a military college, so I got locked up for four years. 
I came out in 1966, moved into Greenwich Village, and weed was everywhere. 1962, hardly anybody heard about weed. Four years later, weed is everywhere. How the heck did that happen? Hippies. Hippies. And hippies were rejected in society in the 60s, and part of what they said was, your whole alcohol and tobacco thing is whacked. Down in Mexico, they got this drug, marijuana, and it's way better. And they went down there, bought it. It came as a brick, 2.2 pounds, a kilo, okay? Uh, uh, um, they smuggled it across the border. Whoever had it, when they got it, they, they went out and bought a box of sandwich baggies. And they'd take the brick and break off handfuls and fill up the sandwich baggies. It, it, it was called a lid back then. They didn't even have a scale. They just filled up the sandwich baggie, okay? And it cost about $5. Whoever had that rolled up a couple of doobies. You'd have four or five people sitting around. They'd all smoke the weed, and they got high. Believe me, sick, hippies in the 60s got high. I was there, okay? That drug that came from Mexico, that weed, was one to 3% THC. And it's really important to understand the drug worked fine. Hippies got high in the 60s, it guaranteed, okay? Next thing that happened was the Vietnam War. And a lot of people went to Vietnam, including me. And I smoked weed in Vietnam. And the weed in Vietnam was a totally different ball game. Another time I'll tell you the story about me smoking weed in Vietnam, but it wasn't pretty, okay? That weed was 5 to 10% THC. Now if you do the math, let's say this is 2% and let's say this is 8%, this weed was four times stronger than this weed. It turned out that, that, that it was a, a different strain. The strain in the United States was cannabis sativa, but the strain in Vietnam was cannabis indica. And the indigo is a much stronger strain than the sativa, okay? Four times stronger, picture it with alcohol. It's kind of like you order a rum and coke in the States, and then you order a rum and coke in Vietnam, only they put four shots of rum in instead of one. That was this weed. A lot of soldiers said, hey man, if we brought this back to the States, we would be able to make ourselves some big bucks. And for most of them, when they came back to the States, they came across the Pacific and landed in California. And a number of those people took these into seeds, put them in their pockets, landed in California and said, let's go up north, up in that Ukiah area, up in that, in, in that Humboldt County area. They, they just got trees up there. We'll plant these seeds and start ourselves a little marijuana business. Boy, did they ever. Okay, and you ain't seen nothing yet. It's unbelievable. Okay, so now they start to grow it. They learn that if, when the plants are only about three weeks old, you have a male plant and a female plant. You can tell the difference. One has a little blue flower. What the grower does is go around and dig up all the male plants and throw them away. So the female plants grow by themselves. Without a male plant around, the female plants don't get fertilized. And if they don't get fertilized, they don't make seeds. So the, po so the potency of the plant, instead of going into the seed, goes into the bud. So they started to grow just female indigo plants. That bumped it up to 10 to 15% THC. And you guys weren't born yet. We got to fast forward about 30 years, okay? Meanwhile, they're up there with hybrids and cloning and fertilizing and everything else. So the common wheat in this area is 20 to 25% THC. I want to say something about this, this common weed. I have a 17-year-old son who goes to Berkeley High. And he says to me, Dad, you can go across the street and buy a nickel bag of purple bud. What a nickel bag of purple bud is, is a bud that's about that big. And a nickel is $5 on the streets. Well, and it's 20 to 25% THC. I've traveled around the world. This is some of the most potent weed you can buy anywhere in the world. I'm talking India, Jamaica, Pakistan, what we got right up here. And the second thing is, <coughs> I don't know if you know it, you probably do, that if you took that nickel bag and you brought it to New York, you get $20 for it. The only reason it's so cheap is that this is where it comes from. 
So you guys are exposed to some of the strongest weed in the world, and it's cheap. <coughs> and it's right here. And now, all of a sudden, in comes legalization. So now, all of a sudden, we got big business in on this, and big business has figured some stuff out. One of the things they figured out is you take this 20 to 25% bud and you blow butane through it, like from a butane lighter. What comes out the other side is a more highly concentrated stuff called wax. And wax is right around 50% THC. And then I don't want to go through all the processes, you know, but I'll tell you what the last one is. The last one that you get to, no, is a dab. And a dab is 95% or more THC. And not only are they coming in at this place, but then the tobacco companies have come in. Boy, I thought we had them. But they come in and figured out how to invent a little battery that heats up a coil so hot that whatever touches that coil vaporizes off the coil. So you can take anywhere from 50 to 95% THC, put it on a little coil and go like that. And just in hand, there's no smoke, no smell, no fuss, no muss. This is where people are at at this point. And you want to know something? It's a joke. They make a joke out of it. I was at one school where, where the kids, this is a dance. It's called dabbing. And where the dance comes from is you inhale 95% THC, after which you cough your brains out, okay? And so the dance is somebody coughing their brains out, and that's dabbing. This is all introduced now. This is what these guys are looking at at this point. Okay. There are two pretty strange things about marijuana that I want you to understand that make it also different than some of these other drugs. Number one, it's fat soluble. Most drugs dissolve in liquid. So they dissolve in liquid, they go up to your brain, they get you high, then the heart pumps it through the liver, the liver filters it all out, and in a day you pee it out. Okay, not so with weed. Because weed is fat soluble. That's why you can make an edible so, so easily. All you need with an edible, to make an edible, is, is you take the marijuana bud and you take some butter, which is pure fat. And you just put the two together, turn the heat up, THC goes into the butter, you take the butter, you put it into a cookie or brownie, and now you got yourself an edible. Okay. Well, when it goes into the human body, not as an edible, but just any which way it gets into the human body, it goes into the fatty tissue in the human body as well. And so it doesn't get filtered out by the liver right away. And the most fatty tissue in the body is not your butt or your thigh. It's brain cells. That's what the brain uses for fuel, is fat. And it covers it with oxygen. So it stays here. Anybody know how long it stays there? No. It's funny, people don't know. So they, three. Three days. And the way you know is if you've ever been on probation and you had to go to your probation officer and the probation officer hands you a cup and you got to go pee in the cup. If you only used once, three days before you come up with a clean urine analysis test. However, if you smoke more than every three days, like let's say you smoke every day or every other day, then before that goes out of your system, you put more in. Before that goes out, you put more in. Before that goes out, you put more You do that for a couple of months. Now you won't com come up with a clean urine analysis test for 30 to 45 to 60 days. So it's st that's why you don't feel a hangover. That's why you don't go through withdrawal. It's still there. And what's my concern about it being still there? This is the one that... I really teach to my teacher colleagues on this because I want teachers to understand this. So, one of the places in the brain, that's a cannabinoid site, is a place down here called the hippocampus. And what this guy is connected with is memory, okay? So I'm gonna draw memory over here, but it's really located all throughout the system. And I wanna say something else. When I say memory, I don't mean just the things you remember. Think of how much you knew when you were 10 
and how much you know now. That is a lot. That's what you got going on here, okay? And what the hippocampus does, and remember, this is the thinking part of the brain. So, so this is a subconscious part of the brain. And what it does is it helps this guy out. Whatever this guy is working on, whatever this guy is doing here, it goes into all your memory banks and pulls up all your knowledge about whatever it is you're doing. Example, you pick up an apple and you take a bite out of the apple. If the apple tasted like a banana, it would freak you out. Why? Because before you ever took a bite out of that apple, the hippocampus goes, hey, check it out. We're going to have an apple. Is it a red apple? Is it a green apple? Is it a yellow apple? Oh, it's a green apple. Is it a Pippin? Is it a Granny Smith? I mean, you've got apple knowledge that gets pulled up before you ever take a bite out of the apple. That's why you expect it to taste like an apple. You with me on this? Let's go to school. Fourth grade. Teacher says in fourth grade, OK, class, we're now going to start learning about percents. So I'm going to start teaching you about 50%. In this fourth grader's brain, this hippocampus goes down and says, oh, I know about parts of a number. I got fraction knowledge. Not only that, but this year we learned about decimals. I got decimal knowledge. As a matter of fact, I got a whole bunch of math knowledge that gets pulled up into this fourth grader's brain. The teacher teaches the new thing about 50%. That rattles around in the kid's brain. And if the kid gets it and goes, I get it, now I see what 50% means, the hippocampus does the second thing, which is it puts the new information into memory. So the way that we learn is we pull up from what we know, and if something new is important, it puts the new thing in. And the other thing it does unconsciously is it trashes information. So it's constantly going, that's not important, that's not, oh, that's important. This is the hippocampus. This gets whacked by weed. It makes it not work well. So watch what happens when it doesn't work well. First thing that happens is you don't pull up off a long-term memory very well. So picture the apple. You go and take a, you smoked some weed now. Now you're high, knocked out the hippocampus, and now you pick up the apple and you take a bite out of the apple. Only you're not pulling up all the old apple memories. So you bite into the apple and you go, Oh my goodness, I may have had a thousand apples in my life, but you've got to taste this apple, because this apple tastes special. It's almost like eating an apple for the first time. You listen to a piece of music you listen to a hundred times before, you listen to it when you're high and you go, whoa, I never really noticed that trumpet. There. It's like listening, that's a shift in consciousness, seeing something for the first time. Go for it. I don't question. So, there is none. All right, so say mm, you put, let's see. What if you make a, a pipe out of an apple, then eat it? Will it still taste good? Oh, you oh, are so yeah, funny. Yeah, you, are so, you know what he's talking about. This is not, this is not simply, but you can make a little bong. You can smoke weed out of an apple if you, if you know how to do it right. The apple's going to taste good uh, after your, uh, uh, hopefully the apple will taste good beforehand, but uh, uh, the apple, is, it, it doesn't make any difference whether you smoke out of the apple. You know what I'm saying? You're very funny. Just don't eat, like, through the tubes. Yeah. yeah. Just don't eat through there. So I've had kids that say to me, see if, see if this one resonates with you. Oh, Mr. Cantor, we smoke weed. It makes us more creative. We can really think outside the box when you smoke weed. I say to them, you're right. You can think outside the box. You're not locked into all of these memory systems. All f sorts of thoughts can float around in your brain. And then they, and then they say, yeah, and then we get into these deep conversations. And in the middle of the deep conversation, somebody goes... What was I talking about? I know I was talking about something deep. I just forgot what it was. It also doesn't put stuff into memory very well either. It just knocks that whole puppy out. And it's a, kind of an interesting feeling. It's kind of like when you were two or three years old, uh, 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 you might have gotten down your hands and knees and looked at ants. You're done with ants. You've been done with ants for a long time. Smoke some weed, and you might go, whoa, check out the ants walking around. Okay? It's a very interesting part of the high. However, how's the hippocampus after the high wears off? This is an interesting part here for the three hours. How's the hippocampus after the high wears off? Because this little puppy is quite connected with learning. 
Simple. It takes three days for this weed to get out of the system for this thing to come back to full working order. So it interferes with the whole memory system and it takes three days to come back. And I want to say something else. If you're smoking more than every three, every three days, it builds up there. It might take 30 or 45 or 60 days for this guy to clear up. Marijuana interferes with learning. It's what makes the apple taste good. You knock that out, but there's a price on it. <clears throat> Where are we at? 10 after 8, we're in great shape here. Questions, thoughts, comments? Oh, 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 I'm sorry. The other thing that's strange about weed, besides it being fat soluble, is that there's three kinds of drugs that get you high. Uppers, downers, and all-arounders. Well, it turns out that THC is an all-arounder, meaning it's a drug that you can trip on. Now, smoking marijuana you start to smoke marijuana, it hits these five cannabinoid sites. You smoke more marijuana, it stimulates some more. You smoke more marijuana, and you smoke more marijuana, and you smoke more, you take bong hit after bong hit. After a while, you're not going to overdose. All that happens is that these five cannabinoid sites get saturated. And you just, nothing that's going to, that, that's it. You're just not going to get any higher, and it's not going to kill you. However, if instead you put it in a cookie or brownie and eat it, there's a number of important things. Number one, it, smoking it from the lungs to the brain, about five minutes. Eating it, it's got to go down through your whole intestinal system, out into your bloodstream, then up to your brain. It takes 45 minutes to an hour to come up and then come into your brain. However, when it does come into your brain that way, your brain, for whatever reason, and I don't know, can absorb all the THC that's in that cookie or brownie or edible. And if there's enough THC in that cookie or brownie or edible, you are tripping. Now all of a sudden you discover, yeah, marijuana, and it's the same thing as taking LSD or taking mushrooms, you trip. Let me say a little bit about tripping so people can understand it here. What tripping is about is two forms of hallucination. One is visual and the other is mental. The visual hallucination isn't tigers jumping out of the sky and all this other kind of crazy stuff. It's basically you're sitting in the chair, you, you ate a marijuana brownie, it's 45 minutes to an hour, it had too much in it, and you start to watch the floor get a wave that goes through it. And the wall gets a wave that goes through it. Okay. That's pretty much the initial hallucination that's there as you begin to step into Alice in Wonderland. Okay. The mental hallucination is that you begin to separate from yourself. You have what's called a schizophrenic experience. Okay. If you ever see anybody walking down the street and they're talking but they're not wearing any headphones, they really feel like they're talking to somebody else. They're split. Okay. Well, when you trip, in one way or another, you begin to separate from yourself. And it can be a very interesting experience. If I was tripping right now, and maybe in one way or another, oh, look at here's Ralph over here. Isn't it interesting looking at Ralph? Ralph's a man, Ralph's a teacher, Ralph's a father. Isn't it interesting? And when you hear people talking about it being a spiritual experience or a very deep uh, psychological experience, that's what they're talking about, is you can get some really deep insight into yourself. However, it is a very dicey place, okay? You can get a little bit scared. Like you go, oh, am I going to come back to being Ralph? Because right now I'm split, or whatever it is that scares you. Well, when you get scared when you're tripping, you kind of go, oh, look at that. I'm getting scared. That makes you more scared. And you go, oh, look at that. I'm really getting scared. That makes you more scared. Your heart starts to be, and it's like going down a drain. And you can get into a place where you're so scared that you go, oh my god, am I dying? Okay. Smoking marijuana is a two or three hour high. Eating marijuana is four, six, eight, ten hours. What concerns me, you're two hours into a trip and you're going, oh my god, am I dying? And you're going to be there for another four or six hours. That's the thing about tripping that I'm waving as a red flag. I want to say in the 60s, they used to sell you LSD, acid. 
Now, when you took LSD, it wasn't if you were going to trip. You knew you were going to trip when you took that. You know what they'd say to you? They would say to you, you have to be willing, if you take this, you have to be willing to die. And what they meant by that was not really die, but if you're on a trip and it comes up that you're dying, you have to be willing to go, well, if I'm dying, I'm dying. How can you go? <laughs> it's not a lightweight place to go to. So that's the other red flag. Oh, and the second red flag is this. Are you guys okay? Uh, yeah? All right. And this one I think is a really important one. What a downer is, is an, is an, is an anesthetic. It puts your brain to sleep. Here's your brain. The classic downer is alcohol, okay? Um, you take a couple of drinks of alcohol, and it puts the outer layer of your brain to sleep. And you want to know something? It's exactly what people want. Actually, adults even more than, than teenagers. Because you put this outer layer to sleep, and you get looser. You're not so uptight. So what's in here can come out a little bit easier. You can dance a little bit freer, talk a little bit freer, be a little bit easier. That's what people look for. Put that puppy to sleep. You drink more alcohol, and it puts a deeper layer to sleep. Now maybe you don't walk so well or talk so well because it's affecting your muscle layers and stuff. Drink more alcohol, and it puts a deeper layer to sleep. Well, now we're getting into a very scary place, see? Because this place here, it couldn't care less about what's going on over there. It's busy sending down a signal to your heart every few seconds to make sure that puppy is beating. It's sending a signal down to your abdomen to make sure you're breathing. You put this guy to sleep, and you go to sleep forever, okay? Now, for the most part, you have triggers in the brain when you get close to this place, and these triggers make you throw up. Throwing up very good. That's your body's way of preventing you from overdosing on alcohol, okay? But what can happen is if you mix alcohol with another downer. Some of the other downers, this one really knocks me out. It is all over the place. How many people, you guys, how many people know what Xanax is? It's, all, it's like what Valium was. In the, I don't know how they're doing it, but, and is it all over the place? Can you get Xanax? Yeah. yeah. So let's say you drink some alcohol. The Xanax is meant to come deep into the brain to put this deeper part to sleep so you're not so anxious and you're not so uptight. The trouble is you mix the alcohol with the Xanax, that drives it right in. And that's what kills people. Downers are what kill people. The thing, how, how did Prince die? Prince liked to get high on, on, on a downer, okay, heroin, okay? But he ended up taking a, a fentanyl, which, which had too much in it, and instead of just hitting it over here, it brought it in here, and it shut down his system in the elevator, and they died. But mixing two downers together, that's what will kill you. And I want to say something. In the 60s, people were doing that. 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, people have been into uppers. Everything from Starbucks to monster drinks to cocaine to methamphetamine. Oh, but now, all of a sudden, things are turning around. People are getting more into down, that, the, the opioids and all that uh, other kind of stuff. But in the 60s, this is what killed Marilyn Monroe. This is what killed Janis Joplin. This is what killed Jimi Hendrix. This is what killed Jim Morrison of the Doors. This took out a lot of people. And it took out two of those kids from Alameda High and, and Bishop O'Dowd that were mixing alcohol and Xanax together. So the other red flag, that I'm, and you can get away with mixing alcohol and weed because weed is not a downer. Even though weed can feel like a downer because it hits this cerebellum and it does slow you down, but it's not an anesthetic. It's not putting your brain to sleep. It's a hallucinogenic. But you don't want to mix up an upper, a downer, and an all-arounder. Questions about any of this stuff? Let me mention a couple of other, uh, and I don't know, uh, all, all I know mostly is the Bay Area, Berkeley High, and that kind of stuff. The other common downer there that probably isn't here is cough medicine. You don't see much cough medicine here. Uh, triple C? Triple C? Is what it's called up here in Nova County. And is it, is it? Not relatively 
too widely used up here. Uh huh. I've only heard from it from the bay. Good. I know. Um, Isn't it amazing that it is Mac so Dre. much in the Bay Area? What? Uh, Mac Dre. Used, um, Mac Dre. He was a uh, one of the first um, real Bay Area movement for rappers from the Bay. And he was using cough uh, medicine. Yeah. And 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 what they call it is lean. Lean. Yeah. You know why they call it lean? Because when you take it, then you start to lean over. And when you actually fall out of the chair, that's when they come and see me afterwards. <clears throat> so, go for it. Going back to the marijuana, yeah. you said that they smoke in it for, you know, like maybe every day. Yes. And so they didn't um, basically get stoned every day. So the, the effect hasn't gone down, right? Because they keep. Yes, so you don't feel it as much, so right. right. So <clears throat> when they are when they have medical marijuana cards, yeah. obviously they can do that because they've been yes, they can. go ahead. But when you are taking a prescription, it says you cannot drive right. if you are under this medication. So you know, I'm just thinking, oh my goodness, how many people are driving out there? Yeah. Yeah. With you know being so high. Yeah. Not and and the thing the thing about it is with driving high, why people don't think what well, you, you know it's certainly not like driving on alcohol or anything. It's not like driving drunk, and you know people drive high all the time. The thing about driving high is that most of the time when you drive a car, nothing weird happens. There's no you know, but if you know you're riding on the highway and all of a sudden the car in front of you starts sliding out and stuff, and now you got a deal. That's where the marijuana has, has its strong effect. You're much slower in, 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 in that way. Because you said that they start forgetting. Yes. The memory starts to, yes. oh, I knew how to do that. And so that um, <coughs> alertness and, you know. And, and that alertness and everything goes way down. And the one that I didn't talk about, which is the amygdala, the, the, the one that was back here, part of what that's concerned with is survival. And, and what it handles is if anything is different or weird, it sets off an alarm in you. You look at somebody and you go, I don't know what it is, but there's something different about you, you know, even though you shaved off your beard, you, you know what I mean? But, but my amygdala tells me there's something, something's different here and, you, and you're on an alert. What weed does is lower that, what's called the, oh, what the heck is the name of it? I'm sorry, I can't think of it. But 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 it, it it makes it so that you don't notice things that are as different. It makes you duller in that way, so you don't feel it as much. And it stays there for quite a while. And the way they found this out was they did it with airline pilots. And they put airline pilots into a flight simulator and had them land and with the winds coming in different directions. And then they had them smoke marijuana and go home and come back two days later and take the test, and they were slower. And, and, and they didn't notice the differences as quickly as they were before. So that also goes for sports. It takes the edge off of sports, too. I mean, most of the time, who cares if you're off by a half a second? But in sports, that's a big deal. In driving, it can be a big deal. And, but, from a kid's point of view, I had, a, I had a kid, this is years ago, I was a math teacher. Kid says to me, Mr. Cantor, can I get into your math class after lunch? Because if I get into your math class after lunch, I can smoke a doobie over lunchtime. And then I'll come into your math class and I can learn better. I went, what? You're going to learn better? Watch from the kid's point of view. So here's this kid's brain. All right. Number one, he was a little bit ADD. Number two, he was not a very happy camper at school, okay? He smoked some weed. First thing that happened was it hit his cerebellum. And all of a sudden, he could chill. Now, finally, I can kick back and chill, okay? Then it hits his nucleus accumbens, and it fires off a whole bunch of dopamine. 
So now he's sitting in class and school's not so bad with some dopamine floating around your head. So now he's chilling and he's feeling good. Then it hits the hippocampus, knocks out the memory stuff, so everything seems fresh and new. He says to me, Mr. Canty, you start teaching about twos and threes. And I go, twos and threes is deep. I never really thought about them like that before. No, unless you start teaching about fours. I'm into what you're teaching. So from the kids, of course, it's not integrating. It's not, but from the kids point of view, it's, it's, it's working, you follow? But it's a trick. It's not, it's not really, really what, what's happening there. It tricks the brain into doing things that, that feel good. But, and I want to say something else. I'll have parents say to me, you know something, my kids still get A's and B's and C's. So, you, you know, I guess the weed is not so bad. And part of what I say to them is, how does your kid deal with anger? How does your kid deal with boredom? How does your kid deal with stress? How does your kid, all of those things, because a lot of what marijuana is working on is not necessarily the cognitive part, it's working on a whole lot of stuff that's, that's in here that are developmental tasks that have you become a human being as well as learning up here. And that's the part that gets me about weed. And if you have this stuff developed, by the time you're 18 or 25, then the weed doesn't seem to do very much in terms of detrimental effects. You watch the two big things that, that came out. One was on CNN, Dr. Sanjay Gupta uh, I was asked to go around the world and find out about marijuana. He blew all his colleagues out of the water because he said marijuana seems to have enormous medicinal value. Here, 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 here. However, people that are smoking during teenage time it has all its detriment. And so 45 minutes of that show is how good it was. 15 minutes was how detrimental it is for teenagers. And the other one was a 40-year longitudinal study between Duke University and New Zealand. 40 years. They studied the same people for 40 years. Now, here's what they said. They said that those that started smoking in any kind of serious way during teenage time had an eight-point loss in IQ. So there is, th th there is some of that out there, but we have so much to learn about this stuff. I think that in so many ways, I think marijuana has a lot to give to this society at this point. It's just that we got to separate out adults smoking weed from kids smoking weed. I had a parent that raised his hand and said, so what you're telling me is I'm supposed to say to my kid, you do as I say, not as I do. And I go, yep, that's right. You are the parent. Treat it the same way you would alcohol. You can drink alcohol and not have a problem saying to your kid, I don't want you to drink. That's where I want us to get to with marijuana. Because I think it's a way better drug than all this other stuff. I think it has a lot to offer in here. But we got to see, and it's, it's us folks that are working with teenagers that see that effect on teenagers. A lot of the adults don't. And I want to say something else. The more marginalized the teenager, the more detrimental effect it has on them. Then they're not doing those de developmental tasks. Yeah? I'm confused. Like, you say it has a lot to offer. Could you explain? I don't, I'm looking at our okay. environment. I'm looking at, I know. you know, there's not enough water. I'm looking at what's happening to, like, I agree. I agree. I was what yes. Well, is it that it has to offer? first time I came and gave a talk like this in an evening was up in Nevada City, and it had to be about ten years ago, and there was a whole contingency of vets, uh, Vietnam and, and and Iraq vets that came to that talk. They didn't want me to say anything bad about marijuana, and they said it took us off opioids. It took us off. Blah, blah blah it's helped us with our PTSD, it's done. So I, I think, and with the whole CBD thing that we're talking about, I think marijuana does, and I would like to say, I'd rather see somebody smoke weed than drink alcohol. I mean, it really has a much less detrimental effect, and it seems like the opioid use in the places where it got legalized has gone way down. I, th I think it's, if somebody is, go and I'm not pushing getting high, but if somebody wants to alter their consciousness, I think it's, it's a safer, 
uh, both for your body and, and what you do in the world than almost any other drug that, that I can think of. So I do think that marijuana, and, and on, the, on, the, on the medicinal end with the CBD thing, I think it has a lot to offer. I understand, and I do agree with you on that, on the medicinal part, because I have worked with cancer patients where, yeah, that makes a difference. Yes. It's their appetite, it's, it's helping them, I, I get that. It's and with the that, chemo and stuff. Right, but I do also look at the other piece of it as to the impact that it's having on our environment with these huge grows when the water supply doesn't support them. Oh, I, oh. So then I start going, well, yes. I, I, you know, on one way, it's, maybe it's a good thing it's illegal, but on the other part, it's like, what do we just do? Boy, and we yeah. don't even have all the rules and regulations to yes. even monitor it the right way. Yes. I mean, I know there are some good pieces to it, but... No, I, 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 I really hear you. You know, when I first really came up here... Well, when I first came up here, uh, I, I did a, a bit of a tour with uh, Sheriff Allman. Mm -hmm. All right. and, and I really liked it. He was the one that really showed me what kind of environmental damage these big growers have done here. I hope through the legalization that it's gonna wipe them out, you know, and, and have the growers actually happen in these greenhouses, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I agree, I, I, I think it's... It's just a concern, I mean, because I had yeah. a patient who was a major hippie smoking dude. I mean, he was one of my favorite patients, but he was also like right up front, like I only need about six or seven plants, that's for me. Yeah. The rest is just, yeah. And that's where Sheriff Ullman was at. He was just after the big growers that are really just raping the land and the water and everything else. I mean, if, if you could be a little more conscious about what you're doing, I mean, the, the major growers, you know, um, anyway, it's just my experience. Yeah. And it's hard to see how all this stuff is going to play itself out. Right. It really is. Here, you know. So, I have a question. Yeah. So, you, you know, you, you mentioned how the percentages are so high. Of yes. Now. So, what is. What effect is that? What's the have? implications yeah. of that? One is tolerance. It goes way up right away. And so, and so what, when I was doing the thing there and I said, well, then you're going to need more of this. You know what a kid said to me the, the other week? He says, no, you don't need more. All you have to do is upgrade. Oh. Just upgrade. You can start doing dabs. You can start doing wax. You, can, you, you know what I mean? Because it's just, oh, and then you can start doing edibles. <clears throat> It's a, an enormous field all by itself. And if somebody said to me, is it a gateway drug? I would say the main thing it's a gateway drug to is cigarettes, is smoking. And the thing that's happening right now with these guys that I, I'm blown away because it's only been in the last six months is that the nicotine makes a marijuana high better. Right. You make it, you roll a blunt, or up here, which is tobacco, you mix nicotine with marijuana. So here they do something called moking, right? Which is they take, we, you don't know what moking 50, is? 50, 50. Oh, you call it 50-50. 50-50, 50% 50, 50. 50, 50, 50 marijuana, 50% tobacco. And then we mix the two, and, and it boosts it up. So it's become a gateway drug to cigarettes, and the one that's come in there, and it's a phenomenon, Jules. J-U-U-L-S. You guys haven't heard of it. Oh my God, it's all over the Bay Area. It's the new way of smoking that's a, a, a thing that looks like something you plug into a computer. Nobody up here has heard of it. No, you no, have, no, yeah, no, it's, no. this is really, it is going to take over smoking okay. with, with, with these guys. And it's the mixture, so the tobacco companies are coming in right on the heels of this weed thing because the two things go together. And it also is the whole smoking thing that goes with it. What is it, though? Well, it's, 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 it's an electronic cigarette. That looks like something, it doesn't look like a cigarette though. It looks like something that you stick into a computer and actually you do stick it into a computer to charge it. And, and you buy a little cartridge and in the little cartridge is equivalent to 100 cigarettes. It's got, and all it is, is a, cigarette, is a nicotine delivery system. It's a great way to just go and deliver the nicotine, deliver the, deliver the weed. Yeah, yeah, that has a vape up here. What? It's a vape up here. Oh, vape. Well, that, yeah. and that's another thing. This vape thing, 
When you think about somebody vaping, when you think about vapor, what you think about is like uh, 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 steam. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, this is not that. This is like aerosol. It's not vapor, it's aerosol. It's like something that you spray on yourself. So it has quite a, a residue effect. It is not, not and the jewels really deliver the stuff. What? It's like taking whippets. Yeah. Whippets. Oh, whippets is a whole other ball game. Well, no, like it kind of has the same, um, same kind of um, physical effect on your body by deteriorating it in a way. Whippets do. It deteriorates your brain. What's, what what whippets is for those of you that don't, it's it's nitrous oxide. They use it for you know, for your dentist, but you also what do you, what do you use a whippet for? Like um, CO2, like uh, airsoft and paintball guns. CO2, right, and that kind of stuff. Whipped yeah. cream. Yeah. 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 That's dangerous. Yes. Yes. Of course, the worst one on all that that I want to say, the one that really kills brain cells, and a lot of this stuff doesn't kill brain cells. The one that does, that's on that same area as whippets, is something called huffing. And what huffing is about is that you take something like gasoline or cleaning Jesus. fluid or or glue paint. and you go uh, paint Sharpie. and you go like that and you inhale it. The rush from that is is really killing brain cells. Yeah, that's not, that's so. like a couple of those can really. Okay, guys. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I just have a question about the combination of the tobacco and the THC. Yeah. Is how they interact with each other. What happens the is. Are particularly for you. What, what happens is nicotine keeps the dopamine floating around longer in your brain. So it increases, it, 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 it helps extend any high. So that's why it's very connected with drinking. Or, why it's connected, or in general with, with drug use. The only thing about it with weed is you're already taking it the same way you take the other thing. So, so it, it's, it, the smoking thing is repeated. But nicotine is a very powerful, amazing drug. Here's a drug that, that, that keeps the dopamine floating around longer in your brain. If you're wired and you smoke some nicotine, it calms you down. If you're tired, and you smoke some nicotine, it bumps you up. I mean, this is quite an, uh, quite an amazing drug and quite an addictive drug on there. It actually has its own, uh, own addictive receptor sites that's, that's totally different than, than, than the other stuff. So this jewel thing and this connection with tobacco really concerns me at this point. This weed thing is, is turning into really a gateway drug towards cigarettes. And nicotine. These guys, these guys already got a name for it. Half and half. That's how we do it. Half weed, half tobacco. They're already, they're already there. Yeah. Questions? Wouldn't that be what a blunt is too? That's exactly what, what, a, what a blunt is. Is is that it's it's the paper wrapper that's tobacco. So you take like a cigar, really where it got its name was they used to be Phillies blunts. You, you, you take a, 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 a razor blade, you cut it open, you throw the tobacco away, and you put the weed in there, and then you roll it up in that. Or sometimes if, if you're in Jamaica, they'll do what they call a spliff, which is that you, you put them both together there. But that mixture is, it really works. And it's going to be an entrance. The, the tobacco companies are right back in there. They also use uh, just straight tobacco leaves. Just use a straight tobacco oh, leaf no, to roll. Like well, back we're backwards. Oh, backward, yeah. Backwards, yes. It's just a tobacco leaf. Yeah, backwards is it. What scares me is my son uses these same terms now, so I've gotten to know him. Or, or, but what this is is mixing tobacco and weed together. And we as adults have to stand up and say to the kids, it is not okay to smoke marijuana now. Because right now, I think a lot of the adults with this whole legalization thing are kind of like deer in the headlights. 
so what's so bad about marijuana? So, or I did it when I was a kid, or it's not like blah, 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 blah. People need to understand that it really is interfering with the developmental tasks that kids need to do between 12 and 18. How about pregnancy and like when women have and, and We don't know. We don't know. People will say things about it, but we don't, we don't really. I, certainly, the, 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 the uh, embryo is getting hot. There's no question about that. But what effect does it seem to have? I haven't seen any real hard research that it's done. Not like we have for cigarettes, or certainly not like we have for uh, uh, alcohol. Or what you were talking about earlier about somebody getting yeah, born addicted with, yeah. Because I've heard it can cause birth defects. I have heard that. I've heard that, but I'm not, I gotta, you know, I'm always afraid to do the, 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 the scare so tactic stuff, stuff, you know what I mean? Unless I really... Yeah, I guess I heard a really good speaker, and so that's why um, Dr. Irish has not... Um, oh, yes. Oh, I haven't he heard... Speaks, if you ever get a chance. I have heard him, but I haven't heard Ira Chasnoff until... It's got to be 20 years ago. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? He's pretty incredible. He he's still a, around. He's a pediatrician. He's retired now, but this is his all his research. Mostly he speaks to alcohol and how it affects... Right. Where is he located, do you know? Out of Chicago. Out of Chicago. Mm -hmm. He just came here recently. Oh, is that right? Yeah, oh, good. I'm glad he's still around and doing the work. Yeah. I learned a lot from him years yeah. ago. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I was like, oh. <sighs> well, hopefully you guys get home dry. I hope that this it was worthwhile for you to come out for, for, for the evening. Oh, oh, can I end it with, with uh, one last thing here? Which is, I, I forgot, one other one that I think is very deep that I do with kids and we'll let it go. Uh, dopamine is not the only feel-good drug in the brain. Another feel-good drug in the brain is serotonin. I know that. I was hoping you would bring that up. And especially for these guys. Now here's the, when serotonin hits the receptor site in the brain, you get a feeling of well-being. Now what do I mean by a feeling of well-being? Go ahead, what are you going to say? Also, I, don't, I use the DVD. Yeah. They just prescribed me serotonin. So keep talking. I'm like, interested. All right, all right. So here's the deal with serotonin. When serotonin hits the receptor sites, you get a feeling of well-being. Now, what do I mean by a feeling of well-being? Go ahead. It's like gambling. I mean, like, not like that. I mean, it's like, it may, like, say you're hitting a button and you expect something to pop out every time you hit that button. Oh no, that's the dopamine piece. No, there's another, like, they go hand in hand though. It's like- Interesting, okay. So you would like do that, but if you take away it, you're happening every single time. Then you having, still have the expectation. And yeah, and having it happen every now and then, the serotonin is- I'm, I'm gonna go a different place with the serotonin. I hear what you're saying though. Yeah, go ahead. The serotonin is the neurotransmitter that, um, causes pleasure among your brain cells where the dopamine is how you react to the pleasure, mainly. Is okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw a different twist on it and, and, and see, see what you do with this. Is that I'm saying that the dopamine is pleasure, right? Ice cream, whatever, hang on, hang on. What I'm saying serotonin is, is when it hits your, your receptor site, you get a feeling of well-being. And here's what I mean by feeling of well-being. I mean that you feel good about who you are. I mean, uh, I got people in my life who love me. Uh, uh, I think I'm a, a good guy. I got skills. Uh, I'm gonna be able to do these things. I got, I, I, got, I got interests in my life. I got a life. That gives me, as opposed to having ice cream, or, or you follow what I'm saying? So I'm almost saying like you're calling it pleasure. I'm calling the dopamine pleasure, but I'm calling the serotonin happiness. And I think there's a difference between happiness and, 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 and pleasure. In other words, you guys are coming here now for this stuff, not necessarily for pleasure, but getting this knowledge and getting this stuff that builds who you are, that's, that's more of, a, of, a, of a, a feeling of well-being. I'll tell you how I would say it with sex. Let's say you have sex with another person, okay? Because right. you can have sex yeah. with yourself here. You have sex with another person. After the sex is over, what's left? No energy. Uh, I, 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 I did this before. The, 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 the girl says regret. I love that.
No, what's left, what's left is the other person, okay? So here's what I want to say. The sex part was the dopamine part. Afterwards, what's left is what we call a relationship, you know that stuff? That's the serotonin piece. You follow what I'm talking about between the difference, between the two? And you may understand it differently, but that's one that I think is, is important, is to understand that, that what is the difference between happiness and pleasure? Well, to, to be almost, well, I can't remember, like when you go exercise and you get that uh, that's the serotonin and and it keeps reuptaking so it stays with you and there's no downside on it. Where here, once the drug wears off, you go even lower than where you were before. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the time to figure this out or time to do it naturally is now, is 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 during this teenage time. Yeah. Good morning, this young man's question about ADD and getting that medicine that Oh, it was not serotonin that, that, that you were getting. It, it, it was uh, a, an upper. It was an upper. And it's a very strange thing because my son has ADD also. When I give him coffee in the morning, it slows him down. It doesn't speed him. For some reason or other, people that have ADD, when they take speed like Adderall or, 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 or one of those things, it slows them down. For, for somebody else, it speeds them up. But that, that's not serotonin. What serotonin, wh where you can get it from, it is um, from, uh, what do they call it, an antidepressant, like Prozac or Wellbutrin. Or the, those, you don't get high off it, but what that does is, is increases the level of serotonin so that you have a sense of, 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 because a lot of people have a good life and they still feel like, because they can have that low level of serotonin. That's where an antidepressant now, in some cases, when the ADD is so severe, sometimes they prescribe it and they press it that goes with it. Maybe that's the point. Yeah. Oh, yes, and that can, too, because if you're ADD, then you get bored real soon. God, life's in traffic. What, what, what's going to happen here next? Right. Yeah. So the combination, interesting. Okay, thank you, guys. This was a great session.